now invite Brad to um, talk about the Young Awards Prize before um, we have the presenter. Oh, thank you. The Awards Prize and the Standish Prize were both established in 2001. <coughs> They were established to mark the 25th anniversary of the founding of ARANS. The intention of launching these prizes was to tangibly recognize the contributions of two major figures in the development of archives. Archives and archives consciousness in many ways in New Zealand. Michael Standish was virtually the founding father of what we now know as Archives New Zealand. He was the country's first statutory chief archivist. He was the architect of the Archives Act 1957. Ian Wards was his close collaborator in these early efforts. He was briefly appointed chief archivist, but ultimately he made his mark as head of the government's historical publications branch. Sadly, Standish died prematurely, in fact, within a few months of being appointed chief archivist. But Wards was with us for a further 40 years, passing away in 2003, and in that time, I think there was scarcely an archives issue he wasn't involved in. His very considerable achievements are set out in a posthumous fish group that was published in 2016, uh, which I can commend to anyone interested. There are copies in the bookshop downstairs, and I can assure you that while Catherine and I were co-editors, we get no royalties at all. For the, for the contributors to this volume, however, it was an exercise in respect. The decision to create the Wards Prize beyond honouring a much respected a much-loved association, Kalmatua, was motivated by two considerations. Firstly, a desire to encourage and to recognize the exceptional use of archival materials, primary sources generally, in New Zealand historical writing. Secondly, as a demonstration of the necessarily close association between archivists, manuscripts, librarians, records keepers, and their using clientele. I can say without doubt that the Wards Prize has come to be held in very high regard, certainly within the research communities. It's been my privilege, with the exception of one year, to have chaired the judging panel since the inception of the prize. Over that time, the list of winners has been a distinguished one. I think the list has possibly now disappeared from the ARAN's website, uh, but I would strongly urge it be reinstated. The focus today, however, is rightly on the most recent winner of the Wards Prize, so it's now my very real pleasure to read the judge's citation and then present the prize. And I apologise if there's a slight repetition at the beginning. The Ian Wards Prize, initiated in 2001, honours the outstanding contributions to the Archives and Records Association of New Zealand, to cultural life generally, and to New Zealand historical scholarship of the late Ian McLean Wards, chief government historian between 1968 and 1983. A lifelong supporter of the archives cause for more than 25 years, ARAM's elder Kalmatua, Ian was selected to the association's third honorary life membership in 1982. The prize recognizes what the appointed judging panel considers to be an outstanding piece of published New Zealand historical writing first appearing in the year preceding each annual general meeting. It is the sub-criteria, however, developed in close consultation with Mr. Wards himself, which sets this prize apart from the other New Zealand Book Awards. The winner of this prize must demonstrate either innovative or exemplary use of primary source materials and otherwise be a model of scholarly good practice. An exceptionally strong field again presented in 2020, making the selection of a winner a very difficult choice. A long list of contenders was initially drawn up through searches of the monthly issues of the New Zealand National Bibliography. This was then ultimately reduced to individual shortlists by the judges of four. After further discussion, the judging panel's unanimous decision is that this year's winner is Sarah Glycanos for Shirley Smith an examined life published by Victoria University Press. And a groundbreaking one, devoted her energies to defending life's misfits. 
the wife of still controversial economist Bill Such, who, despite her strong feminist beliefs, nevertheless felt impelled to accept traditional domestic roles. Often viewed not altogether justly as being in her husband's shadow, the author seeks to recount the events of Shirley's life from her personal point of view. What emerges from the book is a woman of strong principles and integrity, one who consistently confronted obstacles and generally surmounted them. The life is outlined against a backdrop of times when the political tone of the intelligentsia was more left-leaning than in recent decades. The author's judgments in this book are based on a prodigious research effort. Moreover, one that is at least hinted was not without its difficulties. Beyond wide reading and the secondary sources, the work is underpinned by research, not only in the subjects of available personal papers, but also in those of many contemporaries. Files and archives in New Zealand and other New Zealand repositories have been consulted, also caught in other legal records, as well as those of schools and universities. Moreover, the documentary search has extended beyond these shores and universities. Moreover, uh, especially in repositories in the United Kingdom and the United States. Befitting an oral historian, the author has taken every opportunity to interview prospective informants, more than 100 being listed in the, in the um, bibliography. Engagingly, however, wherever possible, Shirley Smith is permitted to speak for herself. Shirley Smith, An Examined Life, is well written, it holds the reader's attention, and it's nicely produced. In all respects, this book is a worthy successor to previous winners of the Year Awards Prize. Thank you. In a kōtū kātua, well, I am greatly honoured to receive this award, and I thank you with all my heart. I thank you, Brad, for the citation, which uh, I'm a bit overwhelmed, at. <laughs> but um, I feel very humbled by this, and um, it means a great deal to me for many reasons. One reviewer wrote that Shirley Smith and Examined Life would be relished by history buffs and policy nerds. I don't know whether that, that describes ARAM's members, but I'm delighted to be judged by scrupulous scholars, just as so I didn't come to uh, biography from a scholarly background, but I was lucky that when I started writing my first biography, Nola Miller, I was at the Stout Centre around people like Brad, who influenced me more than they know. I remember a parting comment from Brad that made me think. He said that the first thing that he did when he picked up a work of non-fiction was to check the end notes. They would tell him whether or not to look any further. Well, there are no end notes in Shirley Smith and Examined Life. I'm glad that didn't stop you reading, Brad. <laughs> um, I recall you disapproved of footnotes, and it never occurred to me to have them. And the decision was made in a flash at the typesetting uh, stage when my publisher suggested out of the blue that we move them because they carried a lot of information. It was a big decision, but I didn't hesitate in replying yes. Remember, I was on a train when I got this that message um, from him, and I just flicked back, yes, let's do it. But it was quite a radical change, um, and it altered how I actually wrote my notes when I came to refine them further. Um, I know you and the committee have read these notes closely and critically to see what lies below the surface of what appears above on the page, and I thank you for that. checking reference numbers, capital letters, typos, and such like, when I heard that a former SIS officer had been involved in the surveillance of the Such Smith House in 1974. I followed this up, and my source tracked down this former officer in Perth, and I put my questions to him through a third person, who I trusted and respected. My book was by then with the editor, so I really moved fast on this, and 
from the 5th of November 2018, I emailed Fergus Berriman. After telling Madeline, my editor, that I wouldn't make any more changes, I have this to add. Chapter 20, Smoke and Mirrors, page four, second last paragraph. The SDN set up a top secret annex codenamed Vulcan, which involves searching such as office on a regular basis, bugging it and installing a pack on his phone. On his phone, I, I already had that. This is a new part. As part of that same operation, they also bugged the Sutch Smith house. They installed five devices, a tap on the phone, and induction-based devices behind PowerPoints and light fittings. From a Ministry of Works caravan parked in the street nearby, the SIS surveillance staff listened to conversations and movements within the house. My source was confidential. Um, anyway, that's, that was the new part. I continued with what I had previously. Nothing came of the taps and bugs, but the search of such as office produced a diary in which he had written the dates of and cryptic references to his clandestine meetings, plus Godot, just em emphasize cryptic because it is still used as a reason for his innocence that he kept open records in his diary. The cryptic annotations lined up with meetings the SIS had observed, missed, and um, seen abandoned. Only then did I think, whoa, I'd better check this out. <laughs> I spoke to Richard Hill, who was highly skeptical about using a caravan in a suburban street with teams of um, surveyors coming and going over many months. And I had a lot of questions for the SIS, which resulted in interesting new information, along with a firm denial that it happened. One of the points a former female SIS officer made was that they never suspected Shirley of knowing about Bill's activities. I, I thought that was correct and I was glad to have that affirmation. Um, that they didn't, she didn't know about his meetings with Buzz Goddard. So there would have been no purpose in bugging the house and they didn't have the resources to do so anyway. I wanted to know um, about the tapes themselves because there would have been hundreds of them. And I learned a lot more about bugging operations and how they bugged such as office in, but probably wasn't important from a biography about Shirley. Um, I asked a lot more questions about Sir Guy Poles and his investigations, and the end, the end result was I had to accept that the story didn't stack up. It's still a bit of a puzzle. Smith worked tirelessly on behalf of those values. I had a subject who really nudged New Zealand in the right direction towards Jacinda Ardern's politics of kindness. Um, yeah, uh, we, we, have a, we have a five minute uh, slot just for that. If anyone's got any questions, um, please ask away. Sarah, you were put in a very peculiar situation where, whereby you had access to Shirley's correspondence but no access to the Bill Sutch archives. Did this raise issues for you about how you were treating him? Um, well, let me, a slight correction there. I had some access to Bill's archives because Shirley put some of her papers there that had nothing to do with Bill. I mean, her photographs, her photo album, for example, from Oxford, and she never met Bill, it was in the such papers, and there were some other letters, and there were letters that Bill wrote to Shirley that were clear from the catalogue, that's what they were, so I eventually, after a long, a long time, got permission to see those, and um, I knew there were other, other things that I should see, but I couldn't tell from the catalogue, and the process of getting permission was so 
should <laughs> that I just thought I had enough material anyway. Um, it didn't alter how, I don't think it did, because I mean, I don't know what I can see. I, I suspect that a lot of the things I had in Shirley's papers were duplicated in his. Um, because what I was looking for was not information about Bill so much as, but what I, keeping the focus on Shirley, I wanted to see things that, for example, what she did during the Sykes trial, because I, Ethan told me himself that there were papers there, I never saw those. Um, I wanted to, if there was anything that, sh oh, I mean, you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> um, there was, there was a letter I know there from Helen, her friend Helen Garrett, who had been a great friend, childhood friend and friend of Oxford, and then Helen had gone way to the right, and they'd fallen out. But Helen wrote in great sympathy and invited Shirley to, um, it was because Keith told me right at the beginning, to um, you know, come and stay if, if that was any help at this time. She really understood how horrible that whole year would have been in 1974. Uh, it would have been good to have had that because that's part of the story. She's one of the people in my story, but I just didn't know exactly where it was. And so there were things that I would have put in, I'm sure, if I'd, if I'd seen them. Um, I don't know whether it would have changed how I wrote about Sykes himself. I can't answer that without knowing what's there. Just a quick observation, if I may. Um, I remember hearing you on Radio New Zealand a year ago, I think it was, and I just checked, and there's a lot of really good stuff about this on as podcasts, which I recommend to Lauren if you just do a search on the Radio New Zealand app. Including Keith Albert stuff as well. Uh, well, he's been on the radio since, of course. Yes. Um, now time for Eric to give us some background to the Margaret Standish Prize. Thank you Tom, thank you everyone. I think Rad has already given the background to both prizes so I'll go straight to the citation. It is my pleasure to read the citation for the Margaret Standish Prize for 2020. The Matthias Standish Prize honors the first permanent chief archivist of the National Archives and architect of the 1957 Archives Act. He can be considered the father figure of the modern archives of New Zealand. It is awarded biennially. The prize, which was first offered in 2001, recognizes an outstanding essay by an Arrange member who is a New Zealander, a New Zealand archivist or records manager dealing with some facet, facet of archives or records management, administration, history, theory, and or methodology, and published in artifacts or another recognized um, archives or records management or other appropriate journal from within New Zealand or internationally. This year, the selection of a winner followed a thorough process and extended deliberations. All articles from artifacts in the last two years were considered. Several announcements were made and also for, to inform anyone who has any relevant publications within New Zealand and internationally to submit their work for consideration. With a long list of equally good essays to select from, the, select, the, selection, the selecting panel was guided by high principles, including the following criteria to select an essay that identifies a genuine problem relating to archives or records management and administration history and future, future memory within the records and archives community of New Zealand. It also provides a clear and easy to follow methodology to address the problem.
and also shows practical hands-on approach in a way that can easily be replicated by others in the records management or archival community if they want to follow the same process in their own context. It should demonstrate results or conclusion that is real, practical, and easy to understand by all, both within and outside archives community. You don't have to be an archivist to understand the usefulness of the information in the paper. The paper should also have a means, there shouldn't be any means of getting to know about the information presented in the article. And it should make references to success stories and appropriate literature. It should be clearly written and can easily be read and understood and can be applied by all readers, both within and outside the archive community. Based on these criteria, the panel members unanimously agreed on four outstanding articles from which the winner was finally decided. With all essays showing equal value and significance, Elizabeth Charlton's reappraisal and deaccessioning, applying um, a dangerous practi practice in New Zealand was found to identify a unique problem in the archival community and demonstrates a systematic process to achieve practical results that readers do not have to be activists to understand. Elizabeth's article provided a broad overview of reappraisal discussion in, within New Zealand and the professional context. It explored how New Zealand archivists often refer to overseas archival procedures and processes to establish and grow domestic practices and guides how this can be done safely and ethically. The methodology showed, she followed showed a clear process to present a specific case study depicting one concrete application of reappraisal and deaccessioning in New Zealand. The study provides a practical explanation of how reappraisal was applied in the Marist archive. The creation and inclusion of templates provide a practical stepping stone for institutions and reveals that the author has given back to the sector which has provided support. Selected examples are provided with context and rationale for reappraisal and deaccessioning. Elizabeth's article is a useful tool for New Zealand archivists intending to review their collections using an informed research strategy and procedure. As such, the judging panel believes that it is a worthy successor to the previous winner of the Michael Standish Prize. Thank you.